Okay, we've moved from the identification systems into really understanding some of the material behavior of our hazardous materials. And this isn't meant to be a chemistry class, as you should have some basic chemistry, but just the way of practically thinking about the materials that we're managing. You're going to get some excellent information from Chapter 11, Tools of the Trade, from our text. It is my favorite chapter in the text, as well as um, Chapter 2 has properties and toxicological um, information of hazardous materials. And all of these really give you a much richer description of the properties that we'll be discussing. So our outline for today is we're just going to understand the basic relationship between the chemical and the physical properties and how you can use them to not only identify the hazardous materials that you have on site, but also ways in which you can keep them safe in the um, workplace as well as safe in the environment. And there's lots of great um, case studies from the Chemical Safety Board, and I'm hoping that somebody took a look at this um, alley alcohol vapor um, explosion that occurred because it actually um, was heavier than air. It was released um, in an area where there was a valley and um, the materials built up and they had to do um, shelter in place, which we'll learn about, although most people are experienced with it now that we've gone through COVID. So in material behavior, secondary containment and redundancy is one of the ways that we could ultimately prevent the release of the agent if the agent um, leaves its container. So hazardous materials rarely leave their containment on their own. Some form of situation sets them in motion. Um, we can think of um, these four main types, and this is used in risk analysis or threat management. And the first one is some form of human error. And an example would be um, Three Mile Island, although we know that there was more process error uh, evaluated in that situation as well. And then we have these intentional acts of harm, such as the Kuwaiti oil field fires, um, environmental conditions that may cause a release, such as the nuclear disaster at Fukushima, that's still causing problems today. And then the last one would be the container or equipment has a flaw or a failure that causes this type of release. And there's never one single cause, but there's different ways in which we can um, evaluate this and put these into their different categories and see which ones create the most risk in our environment that we work in. And usually we can control human error to some degree through training and education and proper selection and oversight we hope that intentional acts of harm will not occur on our job site and we protect through safety measures. But these environmental conditions or the container or equipment are ways in which um, we may be at risk of loss from hazardous materials. And who do we call? Well, we don't call Ghostbusters anymore. We call 911. And 911 is as burdened as you see in this picture. They wear a lot of hats and they may not know anything about the material in which is being released into the environment other than what you have shared with them through the community meetings or community right to know, their previous experience, and what they find on site when they arrive. So although we think 911 will always save us, and they certainly come to do that, they're only as prepared as um, we help them to be. So this is fairly straightforward, and it's from the model in the book. It's, But I like the way that it pulls these different types of properties together. Um, so the things that we think about is um, what the element is. Is it um, solid, liquid, or gas? Um, is it a compound, a mixture, a solution, a solary? Is it a cryogenic? Um, what Basically, what physical state is it in? What temperature does it best perform in, warm or cold, or not best perform in, but keep us the safe, safest in? Some of the things I'm really going to focus on are these vapor densities and boiling points, because we can learn a lot just from those two physical characteristics of the agent. So this really would be a good place where you have that safety data sheet out or those safety data sheets, and you're taking a look at them, 
and you're looking up these different properties and which ones are really salient. Um, so there's definitely critical temperatures and pressures in which the agents will start to change. For example, ice would melt or um, alcohol will um, start to evaporate or condensate. So for our flammability hazards, we think about our flash point and our fire point, our auto ignition temperature, as well as our uh, flammability range, and that's old school called the explosive range. Now reactivity, those are the ones that tend to get us in trouble because we don't expect them to do the damage that they do as quickly. Um, but reactive agents can be oxidizing agents, water reactive, air reactive. Um, they can create polymerization and they can have a self-accelerating decomposition temperature. And we'll take a look at that some more. So if you're thinking about that NFPA diamond, that's that yellow zone. And then corrosive hazards, um, we look at our pH, the concentrations, and whether it's an acid um, versus a base. And so in our on-scene, um, when we're evaluating the release of a material on-scene, and we're going to um, talk about this more in a different module, we do look at what the state is. And basically, um, you can run from a solid as long as it's not off-gassing something. And you can kind of run from a liquid, too, and put up some kind of dam or barrier um, to stop the liquid from leaving its container, maybe simply rolling it on its side or putting up some sorbent pads. But the most dangerous one is always the gas, because once it leaves its container, it um, expands rapidly. And if the uh, agent itself is not um, necessarily toxic, sometimes just its displacement of oxygen can get us in trouble. And so if we break this down now between our gases, our liquids, and our solids, you can see the different hazards level we look at. So for a solid, um, we may actually in inhalate the small particles or we may be more exposed to um, hazards associated with contamination because it's left on a surface. And so these have some kind of toxicity level to them. Um, liquids and gases do as well, but we really look at our solids this way. For our liquids, our vapor pressure and our specific gravity. So our vapor pressure is how volatile it is, how much toxic fume is coming off of the liquid, as well as the specific gravity, and that's when it um, goes into water. Is it heavier than water or is it lighter than water? Or is it just completely soluble in water? And then even with our gases, we can look at these with our liquids, but we look at our lower and upper explosion limits. Um, this would be our vapor density, somewhat similar to specific gravity, although we're looking at where does the vapor fall in air whether it rises above our air column, kind of mixes with it, or falls below, and what the flash point is. So while I'm certain everybody is familiar with the three forms of matter, it definitely is something we need to think about all the time because it's it, um, a, a, the way the chemical will behave to changes in temperature and pressure have to do with how it first starts. And so, of course, with solids, the molecules are very close together, and it's relatively difficult to compress a solid. It has a fixed volume. Um, liquids, their molecules, molecules are close together, but, of course, not as close together as a solid. Um, you can compress a liquid somewhat, usually through a cooling process, as well as you can expand it through heating. And then we have our gases. Our gases are highly compressible, and that volume is highly variable because you can compress down a gas and get it into a smaller container or heat it up and have it um, expand and the molecules move full out further apart. And so most uh, agents go through the phase from solid to liquid and liquid to gas, but some of them go directly from solid to gas, and that's called subliming. And remember that aerosols are solids. They could be, um, or aerosols can be solids. So you can have a tiny uh, fiber in the air, and that would be an aerosol, or you can have a liquid droplet in the air, and this would also be considered an aerosol. Aerosols are not um, gases. Gases are different. They don't have that um, property to them. 
And so this is kind of an eye chart, but it came from the NIOSH Pocket Guide. And since we use the NIOSH Pocket Guide to reference the physical properties of chemicals we may not be familiar with or we may, may need to look up, it's good to refresh what some of these abbreviations mean. And so just through the top of your head, I think you understand what the molecular weight is, the heavier the chemical it is. You're getting closer to a solid and the lighter, more likely to be a gas. Um, you have a boiling point and the lower that boiling point is, most likely the higher the volatility of the chemical. And that's because that vapor pressure will come off quite readily. And then you have whether something's soluble in water or not. Um, the flash point, which is the temperature at which uh, liquid gives off enough vapor to actually create some kind of, um, um, or to um, have a spark, a flash, may not turn into a fire if there's not enough um, fuel there. The ionization potential is really interesting, and we can use um, a photoionization detector to determine how much of a certain uh, gas is in the atmosphere or whether the gas is there itself. And basically the ionization potential is the potential to lose an ion when it's heated up to a certain um, electron volt by our um, photoionization detector, which really all that is is a bright light inside of a meter. Now our vapor pressure is important because our vapor pressure indicates um, whether you're going to be giving off gases or not giving off gases. And the vapor pressure will change with temperature, even just the temperature in our regular air. We have melting point, freezing point, upper and lower explosive limits, which I think you understand the lower explosive limit. If you don't have enough of something, well, we can't get it to burn. And if we have too much, it's like flooding your old car and we can't get it to start. And then we have um, our specific gravity. And that again it references, it's in reference to water and that's where that agent is in reference to water. So let's just take a really quick look at the um, NIOSH pocket guide. And it would be a good idea if you pulled up those safety data sheets as part of your assignment, that you now go ahead and look at another source. So look at the OSHA standard and reference your safety data sheet and make sure it's correct. Or maybe take a look at the NIOSH pocket guide. And I have an actual picture of the NIOSH pocket guide here, but of course you can look this up on um, a website and get a different type of view, but I really like the paper versions myself. All right, so let's just take a quick look at our NIOSH pocket guide for benzene. I like that it gives you your conversion here, so you can go back and forth between milligrams per cubic meter and one parts per million if you need to based on the standard that you're referencing. It also gives you the chemical abstract number so you could look that up. And it's really important that you make sure that if you're using a chemical and you're just potentially going by the synonym or the trade name, that that chemical abstract number is exactly the same as the chemical you're using. Because there's, um, it's really easy to make a mistake that way, um, potentially. Um, it also gives you the, um, of course, the synonyms, um, immediately dangerous to life and health. So it says it's a carcinogenic at 500 parts per million. And then we have um, the NIOSH recommended exposure limit, which is your REL, the OSHA permissible exposure limit, um, which is our federal standards. And this over here is our measurement methods. So if you wanted to measure benzene in the environment, you can go to the NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods 1500 or 1501, and you can find the method that you would use to evaluate the um, occupational exposures. It tells you that it's a colorless liquid and it becomes a solid um, at 42 degrees. So it changes its um, chemical state pretty readily. 42 degrees is, well, here in Montana, we can get that on any given day, right? So it goes from a liquid to a solid pretty readily. Um, but it's not soluble in water. Um, it has a low molecular, molecular weight. Um, it has a fairly low boiling point, 176 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, its specific gravity is 0.88. So its specific gravity is less than one, 
which means that um, it'll float on the top of the water, right? It won't sink to the bottom of the water and it won't uh, mix in the water either. Um, it has a lower and an upper explosive limit. So at 1.2% by volume in air, um, you can get that flash and anything greater than 7.8. So it actually has a pretty small um, flammability range, but it is a flammable liquid. That's just its um, lower and upper explosive limit. Then it tells you what personal protective equipment to use and some basic um, first aid. And the first aid is down over here. And you can also see the um, respiratory protection requirements if you needed to um, perform a cleanup or you were over any of the occupational exposure limits. And these are once you remember what the different acronyms stand for, you can see that it's an inhalation irritant. It's an absorption. It absorbs through the skin. You can um, get absorption through contact. It irritates your skin, nose, respiratory system, cause you to be dizzy, staggering, gait. <coughs> and then it cause um, the target organs are um, central nervous system, blood, skin, eyes, and it can cause leukemia. So that's a real fun one to take a look at. So we looked at a gas. Now let's look at a solid. You can see the molecular weight is 207, but it's very heavy, right? So we know it's not a liquid, although it does say that our physical properties, a heavy, soft, gray solid, ductile, which means that we could mold it. Um, it has a super high boiling point and it has a very high melting point, so you're not going to get vapors to come off a of lead. It's insoluble in water and you're going to get no vapors to come off um, when it's at room temperature. That's what it tells you here. But you can also see it has a permissible exposure limit and recommended exposure limit and a permissible exposure limit. And again, these are the sampling methods that we would use if we wanted to sample for it. So what you see on the screen now is OSHA's annotated permissible exposure limit tables and there are three tables. And if we go up to the top and take a look at the header, you can see that for acetone we have the chemical abstract number, the OSHA permissible exposure limit both in parts per million and milligrams per meters cubed, um, if there is a eight hour ceiling or um, short term exposure limit, these are listed. And then the NIOSH REL, which is recommended, but always typically lower than the permissible exposure limit. And then you can click on the link to the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. And so this is one place we start when we're looking at our permissible exposure limits. Um, one thing I just want to show you here is that for some agents you have uh, the respirable fraction, which just gets into the upper, uh, I'm sorry, you have the respirable fraction, which gets into the deep part of the lungs, the alveoli, and then you have the total dust fraction, which is um, basically everything that enters the um, body. And some of that is, of course, cleared out through your nasal passages. So just remember what you're looking for. Is it total dust? And that would be everything that the person inhales, or are you more... Um, specifically interested in the respirable fraction, which tends to be the more dangerous fraction. And so if we scroll down here, we might actually be able to find our lead, which was on the previous uh, slide. And what you see here in your um, screen now is the supplemental information that I was able to find for the Centers of Disease Control. So remember all these um, government sites help us find the information that we're necessarily looking for when we're um, trying to evaluate um, somebody's exposure, whether it's environmental or it's um, air exposure. And so I found this here. Appendix C, Supplemental Exposure Limits, and um, you'll find those as well, and that was the reference in the previous slide. So we never want our new guy not to get burnt up, because they don't understand what personal protective equipment really protects them. And 
um, understanding hazardous materials, all of this comes together when we're making our proper PPE selections. So in our overview of hazardous materials, it's really important to understand these chemical states. And um, temperature and pressure play a vital role in changing the um, spaces in between the molecules and then changing the state from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. Remember, we can't outrun our gases. So <clears throat> teaching math virtually is quite difficult, but let's just take a look at our little formula here. We have pressure, which we held the same at 760 mmHg. We have volume, which um, we, we're not holding it in its container, which means it can change. And then we have a change in temperature. So here we have pressure one, volume one, and temperature one. So we have one liter of something at 294 degrees Kelvin. <clears throat> if we increase the temperature, um, from 70 degrees Fahrenheit slightly to 305 degrees Kelvin, you can see that our volume must go up because these are inversely related with one another. As we increase our temperature, we're increasing our volume here because we're holding our pressure steady. And so we can change the volume, right? Make something expand or contract by changing the temperature and the pressure. And if something's in a container, such as a cylinder, and we heat it up, and it has no place to go, then that's one of the ways in which it breaches its temperature. And so just raising the temperature by 20 degrees without changing the pressure, you can see what happens inside of um, a material, um, or you can see what happens to the volume inside of a material, at least mathematically. A welding supply company minutes from downtown is on fire. The business stores hundreds of welding tanks filled with acetylene, a highly flammable gas. The intense heat of the fire is causing pressure to rise inside the 130-pound tanks, and they could explode at any moment. This precarious situation has forced an evacuation of the area and emergency crews to stand back. The building is engulfed in flames, and the volatile canisters can't sustain the burning temperature for long. Police have shut down one side of the freeway, but the other side remains open. If these tanks burst, they could turn into lethal projectiles. This situation, combined with being a stone's throw from downtown Dallas, has all the ingredients for what could become a major disaster. Then, the first tank explodes and flies across buildings. The velocity of the projectile confirms that anything in the vicinity is in jeopardy. Then another tank explodes and this time the five-foot container narrowly misses a truck on the far side of the freeway. Then comes another one. Then another. And another. Before long, a slew of flaming projectiles bolt hundreds of feet into the air. They pummel the freeway, at times barely missing drivers. The building is now a launch center for the acetylene tanks and is completely out of control. <clears throat> and so this really highlights sometimes the best thing you can do is stand down and stand away and let the incident um, play itself out because that was the safest thing for the emergency responders. And we'll take a look at a decision tree in another module. Pressure and temperature, pressure and temperature. So sulfuric acid has a very low uh, vapor pressure. It means that vapors don't come off of it very readily, unless, of course, we heat it up. But then look at liquid propane. Liquid propane has a very high vapor pressure, and that's because it's a gas right there at room temperature. And something like chlorine, chlorine has a high vapor pressure as well. It could go from a liquid to a gas quite readily and be able to give off that um, volatility or give off those vapors, which will then be volatile either for our breathing air or because they may be uh, flammable. So this one's really important. So if you kind of fall asleep, kind of wake up again and take a look at this one. So this is not um, using... Uh, scientific methodology here that's exact but it's a way to think of it with your boots on the ground 
So for every 10 degrees changes in temperature, your vapor pressure will double. So let's say that we had um, gasoline, which has a vapor pressure of 400 at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens at 100 degrees Fahrenheit? So at 70 degrees, it's 80. I mean, it's, sorry, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the vapor pressure is 400. And we add 10 degrees and it doubles. So now it's 800. And then we add another 10 degrees and it doubles again and our vapor pressure is up to 1,600. And then we um, add just 10 more degrees of temperature, so we went from 70 to 100, and our vapor pressure has gone up significantly to 3,200 mmHg. And so temperature plays a big role in how our vapor pressure can um, increase so much, then then it causes the agent to go from a low volatility to a high volatility. And this low and this high and this low vapor pressure and this high vapor pressure, um, we look at another module where we take a look at that as to where we really determine low, medium, and high. But from our textbook that we've been using, and this is the hazardous materials chemistry, a high vapor pressure is over 300 mmHg. A moderate vapor pressure is greater than 40 but less than 300. And a low vapor pressure is um, lower than 40. So right about when you hit 40 um, mmHg, there's the potential for that inhalation hazard to happen because there's um, vapor in the air. And then the higher the vapor pressure, the higher the potential that somebody has the likelihood of breathing that in if they're not protected appropriately. But all of us know what fire is, but some people might not know what it is on a molecular hmm. level. Yeah, so today we're going to be setting fire to a variety of flammable liquids just to see what's really going on. So in these flasks here, we've got liquid that is about as flammable as it comes. Isopropanol or isopropanol alcohol. So why exactly are we standing here swishing these things around like this? Well, hopefully by doing this we'll coat the surface area a bit more and it'll give off more vapour to react with the oxygen in the air. The oxygen in the flask is actually the limiting factor. So if it was just relying on the oxygen, you might get an explosion, which is what we're hoping won't happen. Yeah. I think mean, that would probably do it. Oh, cool. We all know that um, planes can burn different colours, and that's based on the chemicals that are in there. So should we try some different ones and see what we can do? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Got that. Cool. That's the stuff. So whilst we were all cowering in fear while these things were making that incredible sound, I was kind of wondering what exactly is happening there. I don't know if there's a way that we can kind of work out how the timing of this thud, 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 thud mm. sound it was making, you know, what, what's doing that. So maybe if we chuck a clapperboard or something in at the end, ah, yeah. we can try and sync it up with our other camera and just see what, what what's going on. Slow the audio down as well.
so the boiling point of course also changes with atmospheric pressure water boils at sea level at 212 degrees <clears throat> however um, water will boil in Butte Montana at a slightly lower temperature and this explains why um, we have to make altitude adjustments for um, certain things that we cook we have to either cook them longer or maybe add something in there to thicken them up and take up that water and so um, water boils in Butte at 202 degrees Fahrenheit and water boils at sea level at 212 degrees um, Fahrenheit and so of course vehicles that um, transport gases are equipped with pressure release valves but this is what happens as they change um, altitude um, atmospheric altitude pressure affects them um, chemicals as well so we're looking at the next material um, property which is density and density is mass divided by volume so all substances have densities that vary with temperature whether it's their um, um, specific gravity which we use as a liquid density factor or our vapor density so as temperature increases as temperature is getting hotter the density of air decreases and the hotter air is lighter and it'll concentrate towards the top of the ceiling so what you see here is a gasoline fire with the vapors that have pushed themselves to the top of the ceiling that are on fire so the gasoline itself is on the bottom the liquid and it is um, not on fire it's the, the vapor on top of the liquid that's on fire and as the temperature gets hotter and the, the, the vapors rise to the top of the ceiling that's where the fire is going to go fire science is quite quite interesting and you can see how things vary with temperature and pressure so vapor density is the weight of a given volume of this vapor compared to air and air is just one so if the vapor density of your agent is um, less than one then the gas will rise to the top as you see here and if the vapor density is greater than one then the gas will fall and if it's right around the same density of air then it'll mix in that column and this is important when we start to look at um, isolation di distances and in our previous module when we covered the National Fire Protection Association we looked at this table one in these green pages and you see that um, if you picked an agent that was highlighted in green such as chlorine and it told us to go over to our green pages that we'd have um, initial isolation distances and then we'd have um, isolation distances for small spills both day and night and for large spills both day, day at night and so it's this um, air temperature is temp typically colder at night than it is during the day as well as um, it can also look at the wind effects and the humidity effects as well so all these things really affect what we do in our initial really um, in our initial response and our responses over time and so these guidebooks uh, give us our first response distances and then what we do um, over a period of time and so this is how this all starts to um, play together now when I learned um, hazardous materials management which was in the really early 90s we used a um, a memory tool called haha -ha mice and it's these are the gases that are typically lighter than air and it's not typically they are lighter than air and so we have hydrogen acetylene helium ammonia methane illuminating gas which is neon carbon monoxide and ethane and that's why we have our carbon dioxide um, meters in our house down low because it's heavier than air and it falls down lower and we want it to be where the gas is going to um, accumulate